Bara det. Um, en annan fotis som är med då var kanske en wealthy under det. Look is a hit in there. Um, and we must well here right. So, it's an it's an house. Um, well, the other young Catherine, a uh, well not Catherine son, um, when we at the Mirain Lloyd Roberts, a uh, we an Guithio and Hunger Gwynedd Sev Seer and Ockled Cymru. A uh, wedi bod yn ddigon ffodus, o wneud yn unig gael cwblhau ymchwil um, gyda'r cyngor a Phrifysgol Bangor, ond hefyd wedi cael mynd ati i wneud gwaith ar y llawr gwlad yma yn gwynedd. Um, oh, dwi'n cael lle dangos yn fideo yn. Neu'n mynd yn ôl i yn yma yna. Gret. Um, felly, um, di bod yn ddigon lwcus i allu gwneud amryw o brosiectau ar draws gwynedd um, dros y blynyddoedd dwytha. Mae o'n braf o edrych ar y rhestr o bobl sydd yn mynychu yma heddiw fod llawer yn unigolion o wynedd a mae hynny yn ynghyffroi fod y brwdfrydedd yn parhau yma yng wynedd i weithio gadeiladu ar y seilwaith sy'n gennym ni o brosiectau a profiadau pontio'r cenedlaethau a drwy waith partneriaeth yn unig mae modd llwyddo gyda hynny. Felly thema heddiw um, yn ystod yr wthnos pontio'r cenedlaethau ydy cydweithio a gwaith partneriaeth. A um, heddiw fyddai un sôn yn sydyn am sut fo hynny yn bwysig ar sawl lefel. Um, yn gyntaf ar lawr gwlad yma yng Ngwynedd, fy sen i ddim yn gallu um, llwyddo heb gwaith partneriaeth. Tri llun o brosiectau diweddar di heim, a mae bob un ond nhw yn dod o brosiectau lle dyn ni wedi gweithio mewn partneriaeth a mudiadau neu sefydliadau eraill. Um, ar y chwith, mae gennym ni um, brosiect sydd ar y cyd gyda dimensia actif gwynedd. Yn y canol, mae gennym ni um, brosiect sydd yn cydweithio gyda gista sef um, elusen i, sydd yn helpu unigolion um, digartre ifanc yng Ngwynedd. Ac ar y dde, mae gennym ni um, brosiect sy'n gweithio mewn partneriaeth gyda cartre gofal preifat a hefyd um, ysgol leol. Mae bob un partneriaeth yn holl bwysig pan dyn ni yn dod ati i ddod â pobl o bob oed ati gilydd. A dyna pam dyn ni yn hynod o falch a diolchgar o bawb sydd yn cefnogi mewn unrhyw fodd. Fysef o ddim yn bosib mynd ymlaen fel dim ond cyngor gwynedd neu benyn hunen i drio wneud y gwaith yma dod â pobl ati gilydd. A dyna lle dyn ni wedi gweld llwyddiant sef trwy ddod â pobl ati gilydd mewn gwaith partneriaethol. Yn symud ymlaen wedyn o hynny, pa, um, gwaith partneriaeth arall sydd wedi bod yn digwydd yma um, um, wel, drwy Gymru ydy y rhwydwaith sydd wedi sefydlu yn ôl yn 2019 ar y cyd gyda um, Prifysgol Bangor a Grŵp Cynefin. Er fod y rhwydwaith yna yn cael ei arwain gan Prifysgol Bangor ni a Grŵp Cynefin, mi oedd pob un mudiad a sefydliad oedd yn rhan o'r rhwydwaith yna yn barnar allweddol i ni fedr eu rhannu a dysgu o'n gilydd a symud ymlaen yn y gwaith yna. A dyna ni yn hynod o ddiolchgar fod ni wedi gallu llwyddo i ddysgu cymaint. Um, er enghraifft, mae mentor iaith môn wedi dysgu um, llwyth i ni am brosiectau arloesol um, megis ein hanes ni. A um, dwi'n gobeithio fod bob un o'n chi yn mynd i allu gweld y fideos um, neu rannu link i'r heini ar Twitter heddiw um, i chi allu gweld hynny. Ond yn symud ymlaen, um, y thema ydy wrth gwrs fôn i yn trafod partneriaethau, a dyna rhywbeth mae Catrin a fi'n awyddus i adeiladu arno fo yma'n benodol yng Ngwynedd, yng Nghymru hyd yn oed. Yr gallu i weithio yn partneriaethol ar draws Cymru gyfan a'r gobaith i gael rhywbeth Cymru gyfan yn symud ymlaen. Um, yn, fi, yn diweddar iawn, o'n ni fynnu yn yr Alban mewn cynhadledd um, oedd wedi cael ei drefnu gan Generations Working Together. A un peth doedd yn amlwg o'r sgwrs yn fanna oedd ein bod ni'n rhan o, o symudiad pontio'r cenedlaethau yn fama. A fedrwn ni ddim gwneud hynny heb ddenu pobl i symud ac i godi ymwybyddiaeth a i rannu a dysgu o'n gilydd. Felly gobeithio dros y chwe mis nesaf, mi fyddwn ni'n gallu dod a'r hyny sydd efo diddordeb i weithio mewn partneriaeth i symud pontio'r cenedlaethau yn ei flaen yma yng Nghymru. Ac yn ola, dwi'n gwybod fod Alice yn y mynd i sôn um, yn benodol am wthnos pontio'r cenedlaethau um, yn ei symlaen. Ond on safbwynt ni yma yng Nghymru, 
dyni wedi elwa yn fawr iawn o'r cyfleoedd sy'n wedi dod i gydweithio yn sgil yr wythnos yma. Um, mae yna drafodaethau a sgyrsiau sydd wedi galluogi yn ni ddysgu gymaint o wledydd eraill yn deillio o'r cysylltiadau dyn ni'n gwneud yn ystod yr wythnos. Um, Mae Catrin a fi wedi bod o lwcus iawn a wedi cael trafodaethau a dysgu gymaint gan barneriaid rhyngwladol. Ac er mae gwlad fach ydy Cymru, mae o yn gyfle i ni ddysgu sut mae mynd ati i gael mudiad neu sefydliad yng Nghymru sydd yn clodfori gwaith Pontyr Cynedlaethau yn annog pobl ar lawr gwlad i fynd ati yn cynnwys ac yn galluogi ymchwil o'r rhain sylw rhain ycha. Um, a dwi'n edrych ymlaen i weld lle mae'r perneraethau a'r sgyrsiau yma yn datblygu wrth i'n i fynd ymlaen. Felly, y prif neges o ni eisiau gyfle i bore yma oedd fod perneraethau yn rhywbeth da ni'n gweld ar lefel llawr gwlad, ar lefel cenedlaethol ac yn rhyngwladol, a does na'r un yn fwy pwysig na'r llall. Um, mae o mor bwysig gweithio mewn perneraeth bod, bod bynnag ydy um, ein gweled digaeth ac i symud ymlaen mae yn rhywbeth sydd i angen ar nynnu. Felly, diolch yn fawr iawn a ie, mond i gloi mae o'n greit gweld llawer iawn o'r partneraethau da ni yn cydweithio efo a sy'n parhau yn cefnogi ni yma yngwyneth yn rhan o'r gynulleidfa heddiw. Um, a i ddim i'r estri, ond diolch yn fawr iawn i bob un yna chi, da chi'n gwybod pwy dachu. Diolch yn fawr iawn. Thank you very much, um, Catherine, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you today um, to talk about one of our day's themes, which is really important, and it's around partnership. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm with Generations Working Together. I've been around for about 12 years, um, developing my love for intergenerational work. And today I wanted to share some words and thoughts around the partnership working, which is day two's theme. Of, of the Global Intergenerational Week. And I would just like to say that the actual week, the actual campaign is a, has been a huge success and it's been due to our international partnerships involving 15 countries. And we've got quite a few countries here today that's involved. Um, so we've, we've come a really long way in just a short four years when it, when it was created um, four years ago by St. Monica's Trust, um, who originally worked with the television programme Older People's Homes for Four-Year-Olds. Um, they, the, they were the creators of Global IG Week um, and they pulled everything together. Um, and because of COVID, they were unable to take it any further and they approached um, GWT to see if we, we could take the camera campaign and, and bring it forward. Um, I'm so pleased to see that with the help of our UK countries, um, with Marine and, and Wales, with um, the Beth Johnson Foundation in England and Lincoln Generations in Northern Ireland, we have established an executive group which looks after Global Intergenerational Week and the four country leads all come together throughout the whole year looking at our objectives, looking at what we're planning to do and then looking at um, encouraging other countries to get involved and in, in signing up country leads that will then take the way forward for, for their country. Um, I do have to apologise because there has been a change of speaker today. Um, it wasn't it wasn't meant to be myself. It was meant to be our minister, um, Christina McKelvey, who was our minister for older people and equalities. We have a really strong relationship with the Scottish government, and we're very very pleased to see and to, to continue to say that we've been funded by the Scottish government. And this has allowed us to really build the relationships up. But I'm sure many of you will know um, that Scotland, we've just had a re-election and we have a new first minister. And that has meant a cabinet reshuffle, which we were very sad to see our minister, Christina McKelvey, um, move to a different position. However, we do welcome a new minister, Emma Roddick, um, who was invited to come along today, but just due to timing, it was just it was just not doable. So um, I'm afraid you've got myself and, and hopefully um, I'll maybe give you a few things that you can chew on as, as you go through Global IG Week um, and take forward. But as I said, today is about building partnerships and it is so important on so many different levels. Um, 
over the past 12 years, I have gained so much insight into the challenges, the barriers and the successes of creating and building partnerships. And it's a, it's across all levels. It's, it's from grassroots, which is so important, to local and national organisations, how they embed intergenerational wording within policy, within their ethos, and also for local government and, and national government. And it's really wonderful to, to just have watched your... your um, your short film from, from the Synod. Um, so grassroots, we always start with grassroots. So GWT over the past 12 years has really tried to work on lots of different levels and to create opportunities in the field of intergenerational work and for the work to be sustainable, to grow and to thrive, we need to build solid trusting partnerships. And that's not just between the participants, it's between the actual everybody involved, it's the staff, it's the volunteers, it's the management teams within the groups and organisations involved. And I think what was mentioned previously about COVID, it certainly highlighted the dangers of partnerships, which not all, but some just collapsed due to the overwhelming workloads of practitioners during the pandemic. The feeling of being lost and unsure and how to connect people connect, you know, how to connect people safely um, was another huge challenge. So for me, looking back on the pandemic and for seeing the field of intergenerational work grow, how do we address such challenges and how do we learn from this and how do we take that forward? And, and some of my, my thoughts are around intergenerational training and better reciprocal planning. We talk about reciprocal benefits within intergenerational work. And I think when it comes down to planning your intergenerational work, there is it has to be reciprocal. It can't just be one person. We have to have more than one leader. We have to ensure staff and volunteers are trained up and everyone is well versed in the reasons for the activities and the impact that will prevent this from happening in such a devastating way before when people were really siloed again through the, through the pandemic. So that, that's one area that we really need to remember that the, the, the reciprocal planning and the training at the very beginning of intergenerational work has to be considered and not just considered for practitioners but considered for everybody so everybody understands what it is that we're doing and then to the highest level um, generations working together have, have worked really hard to build good solid and trusting relationships with our um, members of Scottish Parliament and our civil servants it's so important to get on the right side of your civil servants or your local your local councillors your local authority and that takes time and a whole lot of commitment and to ensure that those relationships are solid and will stand the test of time today as a result of the new minister being elected we're going to have to work so much harder to gain respect and trust from our new minister. And the ways that I'm going to try and do that is by asking for a meeting, inviting the minister to come along to visit intergenerational projects, to bring along civil servants to get them involved in intergenerational projects as well. I've sent so many academic reports to the government to see why intergenerational work is important and why it should be involved in so many different policies and reports that the, that the government produce. And I don't think there's anything better than actually getting them along because they fall in love. They fall in love with the relationships. And I think there's nothing stronger um, than that message of actually meeting people on the ground who just live and love um, the intergenerational work. So at the moment, we have very strong relationships with our civil servants, but even then they are reshuffled between directives and it can be really hard to keep track um, of them as well. So it's really important. Global IG Week provides you with an opportunity to build international partnerships too. There's 15 countries involved. And during the week, there's lots of events. So if you go back to the, the Generations Working Together website and you go to the global um, the country leads and the events, you can see all the events that's happening across the world. Um, it can be quite difficult to get to some of Australia's one for the different timings, um, but there is lots of opportunities there for you to do that. And if you can't attend the, the sessions, there's going to be so much on social media. And I would ask you to really, really look at the social media, find an organisation 
that really resonates with you and connect with them. Say hello, find out how they got to do whatever it is that they're doing that's really impressed you and kick off that global conversation. Because I think it's those conversations that lead to ideas, lead to people being inspired, being motivated and just your overwhelming need to, to, to progress this work, I think comes, comes from these relationships. Global IG Week and our partnerships with international partners um, has really come a long way. And I think COVID really helped that for GWT as well. We, we held our hand out to, to all, our, all our colleagues across the world during COVID to find out how they were coping um, with various scenarios within the pandemic. And we all came together and through that, um, we seem to bond even tighter and with their help, we have now been able to be awarded. We're working with four countries in the UK, um, with Marine and with England and with Northern Ireland. And we've pulled together, a, we've, we managed to get some funding from the lottery to look at intergenerational standards. Now they're not going to be called standards, but these are indic inter intergenerational indicators for helping support people on their journey, for developing good, solid, effective, trusting intergenerational projects with the main key element of building really good relationships and making them sustainable. And this new lottery project is going to take place over the next two years. And we've actually brought the four countries of the UK together with Spain, America, Canada and Australia. And we hope that we're going to be piloting these intergenerational standards or indicators as are going to be called um, across 30 new projects across the UK in the next two years and we will be sharing that with everybody across the UK and we hope that our um, international partners will take that and they will be globally recognised. So very exciting, very exciting time for everybody in the field of intergenerational work. I think that's probably my time up. I could talk forever, but I'm going to stop now. Um, there are seven daily themes for Global IG Week, so please do come on to the Generations Working Together website. I'm sure everybody will be able to give you the links. Have a look at the sessions and please do check out the closing ceremony on Sunday evening, which runs at five o'clock. It's an online for an hour and we do have an intergenerational or orchestra um, coming online with us um, from Los Angeles. So it'll be very exciting. So good luck everybody um, on your journey over the next week and your journey over the next year. Thank you very much, um, Katrine, for inviting me along. Well, thank you, Alison. That's amazing to, to hear what's been happening um, internationally, but also in Scotland as well. And um, we have had a question um, by Chris Frederick here as well. Um, I, I wonder if you'd be able to um, respond to this. So he's asking, with Wales and Northern Ireland having a commissioner for older people, why do you think the parliamentary bill has been stuck since 2006 in Scotland and England is still lobbying quite hard? Yeah. OK, I, I can't really I can't really um, comment on England because I don't really know much about the Westminster politics from what I, what I see on television. Um, but certainly in Scotland, we have or we had a, a minister for older people in Scotland. And through that minister, there was various stakeholder groups within the Scottish government that we and other older people's organisations sit on and are represented. Um, so there was never a huge need to have another commissioner when we already had contact with the, the cabinet, with the junior minister within the cabinet. It is something that is being brought um, to the government just now. I have seen, have been in a few meetings where they have been talk, talking about a commissioner. Um, but I do think the older people's organise, most older people's organisations feel that there is already a direct line to the Scottish government. Um, but it'll be something to watch and it'll be an interesting conversation going forward, because I do appreciate that the work of the commissioner in Wales and Northern Ireland has been um, exceptionally good. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I feel like you've oversold me a little bit. <laughs> um, I do have a significant interest in qualitative evidence synthesis. I work with uh, the Cochrane Group in relation to that um, approach to research as well. But obviously for today, the focus is on the findings more so than the methods. Um, and this review, which is a review of previous 
excuse me, previously published studies in this area was done in preparation for a project that we had hoped to do in terms of um, actually running an intergenerational programme here in Ireland. But this all happened in 2020. So obviously we've had to, we did have to press pause on that, but it's something that we're very interested in working on again soon. Um, and I'm just to say, um, presenting on behalf of a group of people here, you can see, including Catherine, um, on this uh, secondary review of previously published studies. So what we knew before this uh, was the intergenerational programs, what they are, formal activities for bringing different generations together in a meaningful way. The outcomes or the success of intergenerational programs has often been um, measured in a quantitative way. So looking at quality of life and depression rather than more experiential outcomes um, like Catherine mentioned, enjoyment and fun and relationship building. There is some evidence to suggest that it's a way for people with dementia, living with dementia to feel socially connected and also a way to help children learn about aging and dementia. But what we wanted to do was bring all the evidence together so that we could come up with some more robust conclusions around, um, around intergenerational programs and their experiences. So this is the objective of our review, to look at how people living with dementia experienced and perceived the intergenerational programs, similarly how the young people experienced and perceived the programs, and to look at particular things that might help or hinder um, in intergenerational program delivery. So this is the kind of technical bit. I'm not going to spend much time on this. As I said, it's more about the findings and the methods. But just to show you on the left hand side, you can see the databases that we would have included for our searching. Um, we screened over 2000 title and abstracts of previously published papers. And then we looked at 152 full text articles to see which would be eligible. And finally, included in our review were 10 studies looking at intergenerational programs. So we may have excluded ones that um, looked at older people more generally, and we couldn't really pick out or extract the perceptions of people with dementia, for example. So with our 10 studies, um, what we would have done through the process of evidence synthesis is um, synthesize the findings, look for patterns, look for similarities and differences across the studies. And then we also, through a process called grade circle, was assess our confidence in the findings that we developed from our review, which is really helpful if you want your review to inform policy and practice, to be able to say, well, we were highly confident in this finding or we were less confident in another finding. An overview of the studies that we had, um, as you can see over 100, well, 138 young people, 167 people living with dementia. The main source of the studies was America with two from Canada, one from the United Kingdom and one from South Africa. And um, two of the studies, so we had a look at what the programs were. Two of the studies evaluated a memory bridge initiative Others included a dance program, creative sessions, architectural design, and other more um, non-specific programs. Um, and the activities that people with dementia and the younger people engaged in included dancing, life story booklets, songwriting, reading, writing, reminiscence, gardening, baking, collage, bingo, music, lunch together and physical exercise. So lots of lovely activities for them to um, participate in. I to have lost control again. No. Oh. So the first key theme, I suppose, that we identified from a review of the previously published studies was about the forming of relationships. So what we saw was that older people living with dementia and the younger people may have some initial trepidation, some anxiety and uncertainty about meeting each other and engaging in the activities. Once the older person living with dementia and the younger people began to feel more comfortable and gain familiarity with each other, those relationships were able to grow. And the younger people 
uh, welcomed the opportunity to meet new people and make friends with the older people living with dementia. And the opportunity to share life stories can help relationships to develop. So you can see most of those were with moderate confidence, but we did have high confidence in the finding that that, um, you know, with time and familiarity, those relationships could really grow and flourish. The second main theme that we um, developed was around interaction and engagement. Um, some of our studies were observational and, you know, in terms of capturing the experiences of the older people living with dementia, this was often observed through smiling, laughing, making conversation and making eye contact with the younger people. Um, as with everything, um, you know, an individualized approach is important, sometimes dependent on the level of diagnosis. The person may have difficulty engaging in conversation um, and may just wish to observe and watch the children and take in the atmosphere. And again, individual preferences may be in terms of, you know, people not wanting to spend time with younger people um, and equally well, that's, you know, we can't always assume that. So it's important to take that into account. And this was mainly to do with the younger people, this theme around opportunity to learn, but we're highly confident in the benefits in this instance that younger people can learn communication skills, patience and empathy when interacting with older people living with dementia and in general developing their interpersonal skills. But they were also able to learn about the process of aging, about de dementia, and I like the way this is phrased, learning about the person behind the diagnosis. And we've, I suppose, we may have all come across instances where we forget about the person who is there rather than and how they live within their world. So it was really important for children or younger people to um, learn this as well. In terms of the nature of the intergenerational programs, we were unable to draw too many concrete conclusions around the nature of the activities or the length of time, or even the age, the optimum age gap between the older people and younger people. But what we did um, find was that the presence of staff was important to both groups in terms of, you know, that kind of initial getting to know you and kind of navigating the activities with each other when they didn't know each other that well. The other thing I suppose that we were sure or that we have moderate confidence in is that, you know, we need to be cognizant of noise and crowding um, and planning the space so that it's optimal for close enough that they can interact with each other or not, you know, kind of integrate, I suppose, but enough space so that people don't feel closed in upon or may feel threatened by the um, activities that are, are ongoing. So I hope I'm within time. I just wanted to highlight some of the take home messages from our review and um, considering the individual's preferences noise levels and find ways to reduce the trepidation that some participants may experience. So again, having the adequate presence of staff and this calming, lovely environment that will make people feel more comfortable um, during the activities. We also um, recommend an additional review focusing on perspectives of staff, caregivers, family members, just to get a more complete picture of how people experience and perceive these programmes. And then consider further development and testing of dementia specific intergenerational programs with a more longitudinal design so that you're not focusing on immediate quality of life, depression scales, um, uh, you know, looking at behaviors of concern um, and things like that, but something more longitudinal so that we can gain insight into the person with dementia, their world, their sense of world. And, are they enjoying it? Are the children enjoying it? Is somebody learning something? Um, you know, just kind of walking away a little bit from those immediate scales that we often find in research being used to determine whether something works or not. Um, and just to finish up, I just wanted to thank, I suppose, the idea for this project became, you know, uh, arose from a personal um, interest in the area. But then I was fortunate to spend time with the Blossom Together programme in County Leitrim in the northwest of Ireland, 
Um, and unfortunately, again, as I said, because of COVID, uh, we had to press pause on the next stage of this. And there is a link for the full text of the article which was published. And thank you very much for having me today. Well, thank you, Catherine. It's been um, lovely to just um, hear that really great summary of such a long period of work um, <laughs> and you've managed to sort of um, synthesize or make it really simple for me to understand the whole process. So that, that's I want really to save great. people the pain of the actual lengthy process. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and I suppose that the next challenge now is to ensure that people know these findings and, um, you know, today is part of that sharing because they are important findings and, and we want people to appreciate that intergenerational can be beneficial for young people, but also people living with chronic conditions as well who, who might be forgotten in certain circumstances. And, and I, I really like your summary in terms of we need to take a longer view on things and rather than be you know, impatient and want to measure things straight away and to see a, a difference. It's about building relationships. And I think that really fits in nicely with the whole theme of this partnership approach we've got for this this event as well. So thank you for, for your... Okay, good, good morning, everyone, wherever you are in the world. Um, I'm speaking to you from um, our lovely garden room in our um, intergenerational care village in Chester, which is uh, in the northwest of England. So we've been going for about a year now. Uh, we're coming up to our first birthday. Um, and I thought... Um, the children would probably speak more loudly and our elders more loudly to you than I ever could. So I'm hoping Kim could just start, I think I can start it, or can Kim start the video? And we'll have a little look at that. Um, and then we'll our charity, we'll have a chat. is all about. And we describe it using one word, people. We connect people of all ages to help build strong and resilient communities where caring and looking out for each other is the number one priority. Our approach is to walk alongside. We use slow, gentle processes that let us listen and see what is really important to children, families and elders. We observe sensitively and hope we give enough security and comfort for people to be themselves and sparkle in their own unique way. We make no judgments. We believe every relationship can be a catalyst for change and when rooted in love and kindness can transform lives, helping people to carry their own story with dignity. Our intergenerational nursery in the heart of a care village is a place of joy. Using our mirrored curriculum framework, children and their grandfriends live and learn alongside each other every day. We are playful using resources that are respectful for all ages. We create beautiful life enhancing spaces, both in and outdoors, where people can come together comfortably and safely. We include family and friends so that everyone feels part of something and can contribute. We think of it as a human ecosystem in which everyone's story is part of the whole and we can all grow at a pace that is right for us. We are curious about lifelong learning and follow exciting threads that lead us to explore and discover new things about each other and our world. We champion sustainability and environmental well-being. We are brave and use our collective energy to make good things happen, even in the smallest ways and moments. We live as we believe humans should live, with hope, compassion, kindness and ambition. Ready Generations is a growing tribe. We choose to sing our stories and shape our futures together. We are always coming home, hand in hand. Um, we wanted to launch that little video um, really on uh, for this Global Intergenerational Week because since we won the award with Generations Working Together, people have been really asking us what we do and what might be slightly different in our approach. So it's that that I wanted to just concentrate on in this little bit of time that we've got together. Um, basically, we are an integrated nursery in the heart of the care village. 
So we are not co-located, we are fully integrated and the children and the, um, our grand friends, our elders, share a learning curriculum. So it's a learning place. Um, and we do that through a curriculum we've developed called the Mirrored Curriculum Framework. And we call it mirrored because it has learning outcomes, mirroring for children and mirroring for older people. And you won't be surprised, as many of you, I'm sure, know more than I do, that the learning that can happen for older people and the care is very, very similar um, for the young children. So we, we kind of come to nursery school together and we plan the day so that we have some planned teacher almost led activities and lots of opportunities for spontaneous play, just as you would in a normal kindergarten. So we're Freudian. We use Freud's principles um, to develop our ideas. So if I just really uh, segment them off to be really simplistic, that what we um, deliver our curriculum through is slow pedagogy. So we slow everything down. Nurseries have become very, very frenetic places sometimes where it's very, very busy all the time. And older people um, approach life at a slower pace. So we mirror the pace of the elders, which really enhances learning for children. So slow pedagogy, which is very Freudian. Um, we use the outdoors as much as the indoors. Um, so we're outside in all weathers with, um, you know, that saying, it's just the clothing that needs to be right. Um, so elders and children spend a lot of time um, spiritually using nature as a motivator and um, helping with, with mood and with behaviours. Um, and then we use communication. Ours is a relational project. So relationships are at the core of everything. So we use attachment theory, Balby's attachment theory to shape our practice. And we have an attuned relationships model that we use so that we make sure before we try and introduce elders and children together that the relationships are there, the trust, the reciprocity is there. And in this short space that we've been open, um, it sounds like we've achieved a, a lot, but this has been probably nearly eight years of work now. We've only actually been physically open for a year, but the, the research that we've put into this is, has spanned over about eight years and is based very much on um, the old, old um, kindergarten experts. So Froebel, Montessori, High Scope, Reggio, um, all kind of mixed together um, and then what we've learned as we've long as early years practitioners about older people's care um, and what we've got now is a focus on invitations opportunities and experiences we never talk about activities because activities um, to us suggest that control sits in a certain place um, and that might be with um, the planning by teachers of activities for children and older people. Um, what we do is take the voice of the child and the elder and spontaneously then invite or provide opportunities or experiences that expand on what they want to explore and what they want to do. So follow, following the unique interests of the children so uh, and, and elders. And what we found in this brief time is what expert teachers um, older people are. So we use them every day as mentors and educators and facilitators of, of learning for the children. In terms of the children's outcomes, we have children from eight months to preschool to four years. Um, and we've seen their language development really, really move forwards. So we've become quite concerned about um, the levels of directional language we use as educators and parents sometimes. And by that, I mean instructional language, which is come here, sit down, get in the car, get out of the car and so on, uh, because people are so busy. Um, and what we found is by introducing that slower pedagogy and allowing people to have dia dialogue, which is reciprocal, 
I am offering this to you in expectation that you will offer me something back. So a serve and return kind of model. We have found that children's conversational language and vocabulary has just done a kind of very, very steady progression upwards, as has their confidence, their social and emotional development, their empathy, um, and really interestingly, their understanding of the cycle of life, that actually getting old is part of life, is part of living. Um, and I think that's really, really important because it makes older people visible to us um, as people who have wisdom and mastery and control over their own lives. So we, we are beginning to um, really work with universities to, to really synthesize our messaging and to try and get our, um, our findings into academia more in terms of supporting other people uh, with developing this model and really moving to the next step from inviting children to come and sing in a care home or inviting a care home to go into a school or an educational establishment, really to develop that onto the next phase, which the previous speaker said is about sustained relationships over time. So we're moving on from talking about intergenerational activity to actually reframing it as community capacity building and asset building within a community so that we see every member of that community as having something to offer and um, something um, to sustain um, their own local environment and their own local neighborhood and community. Um, so we're very much at the early stages. We're really, really thrilled to be learning from everybody on seminars like this and really um, excited to be working with generations working together and just hoping that um, across the world now we can bring some of our ideas together and really develop something into the future that is really magical because certainly our older people have... Uh, some of them, if I use some of their phrases, they say they have arrived in a garden of Eden um, and that the garden of the children, that they bring joy um, and blossom every day. I've just come down from the um, intergenerational choir um, and the joy on everyone's faces just be, to be together and enjoying the sunshine is amazing. So we're really lucky to um, have been given the opportunity to develop this special place. And um, we hope we can share more things with you in the future and we can hear more about what you've all been doing across the world. So thank you for giving us this opportunity to speak and to share our little film. And I hope you, you have enjoyed it. Thank you. Oh, so that was lovely. That was so nice to hear about the work that you've been doing. And, and I think what you said about not calling it strictly intergenerational, it's building communities and strengthening communities and seeing the value of what everybody has to contribute. And I'm quite jealous of you being able to go and listen to your choir in the sun, but um, <laughs> it's lovely that you've been able to package that into a, such a beautiful film. So Thank you for sharing that with us and sharing your story. Thank you. We look forward to hearing where it goes next and um, building on the partnerships that are all already there and um, been um, really generating such joy with everybody, not just in Chester, but internationally as well. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine, for the lovely introduction. Yep. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here today. I would like to thank the team at the Centre of Aging and Dementia Research for inviting me to be part of this webinar. This is also the first time we are actually taking part in the Global Intergenerational Week Campaign 2023, and we are really thankful for the support. Yep. So hi, everyone. My name is Kirtana, and I'm representing GenLab Collective. In, based in Singapore, we are a non-profit grants up organization where we aim to empower seniors through intergenerational efforts and skill sharing. So today I'll be sharing more about what GenLab Collective is doing, some of our intergenerational programs, activities line up for the Global Intergenerational Week campaign, and how we hope to partner other organizations in other countries as well to do greater work together moving forward. 
Yeah, in case you guys are wondering what does Gen Lab Collective stand for, the word Gen basically stands for generation, and Lab is a safe and open space where we envision people of all ages and generations to really come together and co-create and work on innovative ideas. There are two main pillars of work that we actually focus on. So our first area of work is intergenerational bonding, where we really provide a platform for seniors and youths to share, learn, and collaborate with the aim of bridging generation gaps. So we work with educational institutions and community organizations to actually design and curate intergenerational programs and activities. So we do this at two levels, where we see how to do intergenerational programs that involve the family unit and families. And we also see how to promote intergenerational bonding within the larger community by seeing how we can get youths within our community to better empathize with our seniors. And our next area of work, we also work with seniors, those with tangible skill sets and knowledge to see how they can actually contribute to the community through their sharing of skills, knowledge and experiences. These are just some of the key milestones that we have actually gone through as a non-profit grounds up movement. So we actually took part in this Youth Action Challenge back in 2021, which is actually a competition for young rising entrepreneurs. And we actually got the Promising Award. And that's when we actually kickstarted Genlab Collective as a brand new initiative. Starting a ground up initiative is definitely not easy and comes with a lot of challenges. And we had to pilot most of these intergenerational programs refine, iterate and gain feedback from the ground before we can really roll out these programs officially. And currently we would we are recognized by the Singapore Kindness Movement as an official non-profit movement as well. Yeah, so just to share a bit more about some of our intergenerational programs and activities that we do, one of our key flagship intergenerational programs is the Sandbox program. So the Sandbox is actually an intergenerational project where a small group of seniors and youths come together to work on a bite-sized social impact project. This innovative model, which follows the design thinking methodology, we hope that this enables seniors to bring value through their existing skills and share their knowledge and experiences with youths. At the same time, we hope that youths can also learn from seniors' experiences and knowledge. And through Sandbox, we hope to facilitate intergenerational communication, encourage creativity, empower seniors to contribute through their skills and experiences, and see how we can forge intergenerational bonding and relationships over a longer period of time. The next program I would like to talk about is Gen Trip. Gen Trip is basically a fun outdoor learning experience where we are targeting families in general, where we give them a fun um, platform to really come together and see how they can bond with one another. For now, we are doing our Gen Trip at the National Museum of Singapore, where participants will actually go through a curated selection of activities. For instance, some of these activities include a gallery walk at the National Museum of Singapore, since there are a lot of historical galleries located at the National Museum of Singapore. And following the gallery walk, there will be a series of bonding games and activities for them to engage in as well. The next one is Gen Narrates. This is a story storytelling program which we run in collaboration with educational institutions and involving students specifically. Students will be connected to seniors to see how they can interview seniors on their stories and experiences and showcase them in interactive formats. We will also provide training to the youths on how to communicate with seniors interviewing seniors on their storytelling and experiences. And we will be also teaching you some video editing skills and techniques, basically narrative techniques in which they can actually portray these seniors' stories and experiences through. And on top of that, we also run a series of advocacy events and workshops because in Singapore, we still do think intergenerational bonding, um, there are a lot of gaps in this area. One of our flagship events is called Gen Date, where we hope to encourage intergenerational bonding within families. So it follows the dating concept, but instead of bringing along your partner, you bring along, for instance, your mother, your father, or your grandparent, or even an older relative, for instance. Through these workshops and events, we also hope to share knowledge and tools to see how we can build intergenerational connections and relationships. And in 2023, moving forward, these are the 
four focus areas which we hope to focus on for GenLab Collective. So number one, we will continue to do sharing sessions and workshops by some of our seniors. And two to four are more of intergenerational work areas where we hope to see how we can build the capabilities of our community partners and also youths in Singapore to see how we can actually provide them with more effective training to better communicate with seniors. On top of that, we are also moving more into intergenerational consultancy, where we are offering programs and activities to bridge generation gaps in organizations. And we'll just like to share a quick lineup of events that we have in Singapore in line with the Global Intergenerational Week Campaign 2023. So yesterday, we just had the virtual roundtable panel discussion with Singapore and Australia. Australia. And we are also doing an internal sharing session with Mexico on intergenerational practice and case studies. On Friday, we are having a mix and mingle event with Scotland and Hungary. And 29 April, which is a Saturday, we are organizing our face-to-face -face Gen Date event, which is an intergenerational bonding event. So we will be actually publicizing all these events and the recorded segments of these events on our website and social media. And these include the other engagement activities that we are doing as well. Yep, so if you are keen to hear more about our work or partner with us, you can reach out to us. Uh, we have included our email, website, and social media channels here. We are also happy to partner to design more effective and evidence-based intergenerational programs and also share our learnings from Singapore. Yep, that's all from me, and I would like to thank you guys for having me today again. Thank you. Many thanks, everyone for inviting me, very glad to be here. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about our current project, which is called OPTIC. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but it, uh, it stands for Understanding Older and Younger People's Perspectives and Imaginaries of Climate Change. It doesn't end there. And Placed Creativity to Improve Environments for Healthy Aging. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the challenges and importantly, opportunities that we've found um, doing this intergenerational project. We're about halfway through the project at the moment. So it's a year long project and we are currently carrying out our workshops. Carol Maddock is also here, um, who is also part of the project. Okay, so is this gonna work? Yes, there we go. So why are we doing intergenerational engagement around climate change? Well, we think this is really important because climate change is the single biggest health threat facing humanity, according to the World Health Organization. Um, and whilst older people can be particularly vulnerable to climate change today, it is also the future generations that stand to bear the greatest burden. That's why it's so important to involve both groups in these conversations. It's also important to give voice to both older and younger generations um, as agents of changing climate action to understand the experiences of change of older people, the traditions of their more sustainable behaviours and visions for sustainable futures, both of younger and older people. Also, um, as people have already mentioned um, today, there are direct health and wellbeing benefits through social interaction and artistic creation as well. So the intergenerational element of, uh, um, also benefits the participants themselves. So we are working with a professional illustrator as part of this project. Don't be alarmed. These are pictures that I've just created on my phone. Um, but we are working with a professional illustrator. I'll show, her some, show you some of her pictures in a minute. But this slide um, is just designed to summarise what the project's all about, really. So the environments in which we age, um, in which we work, live and play, are essential to our own health and well-being. However, climate change is altering these environments, and therefore the Op OPTIC project is exploring intergenerational climate change perceptions and imaginaries for the future. The idea of this project is to then um, take the findings, which are illustrated uh, in a comic, a bilingual accessible comic, um, to generate conversation amongst decision makers, policy makers and planners and designers in order to co-create guidelines for improved environments for healthy aging. So that's the idea of the project. 
So to do this, we're holding workshops, which are three hours long. Um, they are with older and younger people. Um, they involve a pre and post workshop survey, an artifacts task at the beginning of the workshop. So this is essentially, you can see the table um, of objects that we use there in the top right hand picture. Um, we pick up an object, say what it is, talk about how we relate to it and how, if at all, it is related to climate change. That gets the conversations going. We do a finish the sentence game. So I have a prop here. So this is what we use for this. So we roll a dice and finish the sentence that it, roll two dice, in fact, and finish the sentence that it corresponds to. And that gets more, more conversation going about um, what people hope for the future, what people remember um, about, about communities, places, buildings, nature, hobbies and businesses. So this is, again, to get conversations going and um, to start talking about stories as well, because we're after stories in this project. We then do a one hour activity, um, which can be either creating a comic, doing a participatory video or storyboard, um, a cut up and collage activity, a mobile interview, so that's the bottom right picture, walking around um, and talking about what we see, using the environment as a prompt, if you like, um, and then an online spatially led interview, which is like the walking interview, but online rather than out and about. Um, so this is a bit of a busy slide, but this is what I'm going to talk about for a little bit here to summarise um, some of the challenges and opportunities that we've been finding so far. So in the middle, um, I've just put the workshops that we've done so far. So we've done um, one workshop with a group at the Quaker House in Swansea, um, working with uh, volunteers at a community garden. We've done one workshop uh, with a primary school and a care home, and one with a youth club and a men's shed. Um, so some of the challenges are common to um, many workshops such as this. Um, for example, um, no shows uh, and, and things like that. And others in orange are more um, particular to the intergenerational element. So some of the challenges we found, um, it's, it's a short project. So that's one challenge in itself. We would have liked to have had more time to build connections with the people um, who we are working with. That's why there are some question marks at the bottom as to where we go next. So we've got um, links with um, a traveller community and farming communities, but it is taking some time to get these workshops off the ground and going. So that's that's one challenge is the short time scale that we're working to. Um, and also um, we've had some issues with COVID, for example, with the primary school and care home. There are going to be Three, or three of us team members going along to that, but two fell ill with COVID the day before. So that was a challenge. Um, we've had uh, university strikes, train strikes and school strikes, which have all affected um, the time we've got available to us to do this and the team availability and also the school availability as well. Um, another issue that we've had is we were going to um, provide a thank you of £75 for our participants, but we were unable to do this, unfortunately. So that's been £25 um, and it's a three hour workshop. So it is quite a, a big time commitment from people. Um, more specific to the intergenerational element then with the challenges, We've needed to work around timings and the convenience for people to take part. So school children and older people um, might want to do it at different times. And that's what we found we've needed to work around. Um, the accessibility of the materials. So obviously we've needed to design materials that are um, fun and accessible and engaging for younger people and older people. We've had to adapt the session lengths for, for some of them, particularly uh, with the care home and the primary school. Um, so a three hour workshop was not going to work. Uh, so we adapted this. So it was actually over um, four sessions. So I went into the primary school and taught the children how to play the dice game. And we did the pre surveys and all met each other because it was two different classes, six people from each class. Um, and talked about what to expect and all that sort of thing. 
Then I went into the care home before they had their lunch and did a few, um, did the consent forms and things. And then the children came to the care home after lunch. We had about an hour and a half. Um, and then I went into the school the next day to create some comics with the year six students, the whole of the year six class, rather than just the six people who came to the care home, um, building on what we learned and what we talked about at the care home. Um, so we've tried to be very flexible and indeed we've needed to be very flexible. And we found that this has this has worked quite nicely. Um, the different needs of the different participants and the different volumes that they like to work at. So this was, um, this was pointed out earlier on as well. This is definitely uh, something to think about. Um, Eco-anxiety as well, particularly working with children, but also relevant to older um, participants as well. We've needed to think about the fact that we don't want to scare our participants or worry them too much about climate change. Um, so we've needed to focus very much on providing agency, um, you know, solutions, what we can do, focusing on future visioning um, and, and, and things like that. Um, and the activity types as well. So the types of things we've done, as I say, need to, need to be suitable for both groups. So some of the solutions then, I'd say, um, as I've already mentioned, the multiple sessions, flexibility is the main one. Um, positive framing using different methods. Um, one thing that we found has been really, really useful and very valuable in this project is our wonderful advisory group. So this wasn't part of the initial um, plan uh, when we wrote the design of, of the project, but we realised at the start that the ethics was going to take quite a long time to get and we could work with an advisory group before we'd got the full ethics back for the workshops. And this the advisory group have just been wonderful on helping us to develop um, the, the uh, methodology and also feedback on comics, um, the comic drafts, and also, in fact, uh, the pilot workshops that we did with the advisory group were, were so fantastic uh, that we've used some of these in the comic, and I'll, I'll show you a page from that in a minute. Um, we realised that we really need to have the bigger teams at the workshops, and although um, it couldn't be helped because of COVID, um, and also we had to do two of the workshops on the same day, so we had to split the group, because there are actually quite a few of us on the team, but we did have to split the team to cover the, both the workshops. Um, so, so that did provide a challenge, and next time we will try our very best to not have to do that. Uh, we will also redesign the surveys. So because the team was so small at the, um, at the primary school and care home workshop and the youth club and men's shed workshops, it's very difficult to help the participants complete the surveys, which we had planned to do. Um, so they had to do it themselves largely. They helped each other and we went round and helped as much as we could, but with big, big groups of participants and, and um, small groups of, of um, facilitators, that was difficult. So we would redesign the surveys next time. But enough of the challenges, the opportunities, it's just been brilliant. Um, I, um, a total convert to, um, to intergenerational work. This is the first time I've done it and I just love it. It's brilliant. Um, it's been fun for both us and the participants. We've built solidarity um, around climate change, friendships, um, learning and understanding, provided agency and got lots of ideas um, and solutions for going forward with climate change. So here are just a few, whoops, here are just a few quotes that illustrate those opportunities um, to me. So I've just got a, um, an excerpt from a letter. We had a few letters from the school to say thank you. Um, I'll let you read that in your own time here. Um, and solidarity at the first group, um, one of the participants in the post-event survey was saying about how it was enjoyable and engaging. And it was a pleasant surprise to hear many of the same concerns um, as the older generations had as well. Um, down at the bottom, teamwork. But the, one of the older ladies at the care home um, didn't didn't like doing drawing, um, and that was fine because the 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 child the child that she was paired up with did. 
And this picture sums it up for me as well. Um, Margaret said, I don't know anything at all about climate change. I'm not going to be able to do this workshop, you know. And I said, I know exactly who, who you should speak with. So I sat down um, uh, Oscar next, next to Margaret and he told her all about climate change. And then she told him all about the war and her experiences from the war and how that links with climate change as well. And they were sat, sat together for about an hour and a half having a wonderful conversation. He's very interested in history, so it worked out very well. Um, and up in the top right is a small quote that just reminds me to, to tell you a quick anecdote from the um, comics session. So at the end of the comics session, I asked all of the children about their comics. So who were the protagonists? Who, who, what was their comic about? You know, did it have a happy ending? Did it have a sad ending? All of these sorts of things. And I also asked who included an old, older person in their comic. Now, 100% of the children who'd been to the um, care home included an older person in their comic and none of the other children did. So that, I think, sums up to me. I mean, we're talking about six children, but still 100%. <laughs> um, they, they all really attended to the older person's points of views and it made it it made their own experiences very real to them because they'd met them they'd be been there they'd had these conversations so i think that's why it's so important to get these intergenerational um workshops and meetings happening um this is Again, I'll just put this up on the screen for 30 seconds or so. I'm just looking at the time so you can have a look yourselves. Hopefully you can read it. This is an initial sketch by our wonderful illustrator, Laura Sorvala. Uh, and uh, this is actually based upon um, our pilot workshop. And it sums up quite nicely about why we're doing the whole project. So this is learning from each other. Um, learning from past experiences, future ideas from both groups, etc. So this is the sort of thing that we're creating from these workshops. Um, and this is this is just a sketch at the moment, but we'll be creating um, a comic to share with the participants themselves more widely as well. Do email me if you would like one, um, and uh, with decision makers, policy makers, um, planners, etc. So I shall finish there. Thank you very much. I shall just leave you on this final slide um, to say thank you very much for listening and thank you to all our wonderful participants. And I'd be happy to take any questions as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Marin. That, that's really great to hear about what you've been doing um, uh, with with both generations, but that, that outcome of the, the comics and that conversation. And I think a lot of what you're saying about, you know, you need to be flexible and sometimes research studies have got set ideas of how things should be done according to our approvals, but just shows we need to be a bit more um, considerate of the people who are, are giving their time to help us understand big issues like climate change and how to tackle it together. So it's really great to hear about your work and we look forward to hear what the outcomes will be. Uh, and more will come, as you said, you're, you're halfway through. Um, we've got a few minutes left for question and answers and a bit of housekeeping as well, whilst we sort of um, ensure we've got the settings right. It'd be really nice to get the, the panel back in the room, if that's OK, so we can actually um, respond to any questions that have come up in the chat. Um, there will be a link in the chat as well, asking you to provide feedback as ever. Um, but please do fill that in because we really do appreciate any comments from any of our webinars. And as I mentioned in the chat, these will be recorded and the recordings would be on our um, CADA YouTube, CADA Cymru on the website. And please do share them with anybody who had to leave early or who, were, who couldn't attend for various reasons. Um, one of the things that um, is really important to mention is that we really value the whole team approach today. Um, in Qatar, we've got Kim, Pri, and Owen who have really been working hard to ensure that everything works smoothly. So thank you to all the team and to Lori for translating at the beginning as well. Um, it's been really great to, to work with our, our Swansea 
team here today. And also on the 16th of May, we've got our next webinar where we'll be celebrating how our PhD students, early career researchers, are working with people um, to um, do cutting edge research on aging and dementia. So please do sign up for that webinar as well. Um, so would anybody like to ask any questions? Let's see what's in the chat. Has anybody got any questions? Any questions from the chat? I can't see the chat at the moment. Um, hold on, let's see what's coming. Is that a really positive comment there? Have you got any questions in the chat coming up? Shona was asking about sharing this. I think that that's anybody notice any questions they want to tackle or anything that's from the talks today that you've been listening to each other's talks that you felt they'd like to pick up on and um you know take a bit further. So uh, maybe I'll I'll ask the, the panelists to unmute and say is there anything. I'm interested, Catherine, in terms of the work that you mentioned that you were hoping the review would be the start of a, a new programme. Do you think that programme would be able to now we're sort of hopefully coming out of social lockdown? Yes, thanks, Catherine. Um, I would hope so. I got a little bit distracted insofar as I'm working on animal assisted therapy now. Uh, for people living with dementia so in, in an ideal world we could get all three groups together um, but yeah I'm going to touch base with the Blossom Together program again soon to see what we can do in the long term so definitely need to get some funding organized and um, which I hope to do uh, uh, within the year. Funding is it's you know, a sort of a thorny issue, isn't it? And and Alison, you mentioned that you've had Scottish government funding, um, you know, that supported the development of generations working together. How much of a challenge is that constantly for you? Or is that something that you've managed to sort of, you know, when we heard Merrin talk about, you know, the, the, the buy-in, once it's once you've seen it in action, you, and you mentioned yourself, didn't you? You want to try and get the new ministers alongside now. Do you find yeah. that that's a challenge? It, it is a challenge. Um, I won't. I won't deny that. Um, our funding has been up and down over the past twelve years. We get really good funding at the beginning, and then it kind of tapered down. Change of government, we lost relationships, and that's why I was saying that it was so key to actually build those relationships from all the different levels to be able so so I mean, academic research is absolutely fantastic but i think there's nothing stronger than actually going out and actually listening to the actual projects and actually meeting them so i think that has been the key to one of our successes but it's also then very different difficult because there's so many directives within government within all governments that you could intergenerational work could sit in it doesn't just sit with older people it sits with younger people it sits with health education um so there, there are so many ways and it's, it's about how business. yeah it's how how we get that message out that they understand that it's it's wider than just one slice of the pie basically certainly yeah thank you um there's a question here about asking kathana about the family members response to the intergenerational work and how they change their relationships because we often talk about um intergenerational work with people who aren't family members so you've You've got a different approach. What were the sort of outcomes from that? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mary. If I'm not wrong, it's Mary for the question. Yep, I think it's very insightful to see how family members actually they shared that it's a very good platform for them to bond with one another because in Singapore, most of the young people are busy working, either studying and doing so many side hustles. And most of the seniors or even parents usually complain that, you know, my younger ones or my children don't really have time to spend with me. So the, the older people really think, or the parents really think that it's a great platform for them to spend time um, with, with their children. And likewise, the youths also think that it's really a dedicated time for them to really come and spend with their parents. What was interesting or surprising was that some of them um, have shared that 
they got to know more about one another, some interesting or surprising things which they did not know about one another. So for example, just now I shared earlier about this program that we do, which is called Gen Trip, a museum trip. So through their sharing of maybe their past experiences in school or when the parents share with their past experiences in school, the youths are like, oh, I didn't know you actually used to be in um be in a swimming co-curricular activity, for example. I didn't know you actually used to swim. So those kind of interesting and surprising insights from their past memories and experiences actually come up as well. Or even some of the seniors are like, oh, I didn't know that um, these young people actually know so many slangs these days. Yeah, so those are some of the interesting insights that we that we actually got, Yeah, if that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And do you know what? The, the time has just flown by, hasn't it? And, and I'm really um, grateful for all of our experts in the room today, but all of your networks beyond today as well in all the work that you do to promote intergenerational work. And um, long may it continue. And hopefully this is just the start of building other partnerships. So thank you, everybody, for attending today. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the Global Intergenerational Week. And remember to give us your feedback as well, please. Thank you. Bye-bye.